Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome to our witnesses. Throughout this Congress, I've warned about the politicization of the financial regulation. Some bank regulators are increasingly straying outside of their mandates into politically contentious issues. Take global warming, for instance. In September, the Fed announced a, quote, pilot climate scenario analysis exercise, end quote, with six of the largest U.S. banks. Now, we're told that this is merely an exercise in ensuring that banks understand their risks. But the data, including the Fed's own research, shows there's no physical risk to banks from severe weather events. The only other risk is so-called transition risk. We also know that banks are fully capable of pricing risks into their business decisions, including risks from changing customer preferences over time. So the real risk here is political. My worry is that an attempt to somehow quantify this political risk will eventually result in regulations designed to allocate capital away from carbon-intensive companies. It appears some bank regulators are already committed to doing just that. For example, the Fed, the FDIC, and the OCC have all joined the Network for the Greening of the Financial System. This is an international group of financial regulators with the stated aim to, and I quote, mobilize mainstream finance to support the transition toward a sustainable economy, end quote. In other words, their goal is to allocate capital away from carbon-emitting industries to those deemed to be sufficiently green. Now, let me emphasize, the Fed, the FDIC, and the OCC have all joined this group. The NCUA has also warned that credit unions, and I quote, may need to consider adjustments to their fields of membership as well as the types of loan products they offer, end quote, and that's because of global warming. So here's the reality. Some unelected financial regulators want to accelerate the transition to a low-carbon economy by misusing their powers to allocate capital away from traditional energy companies. But addressing global warming requires really difficult political decisions. It involves trade-offs. And in a democratic society, these kinds of trade-offs have to be made by elected and accountable representatives, representatives of the American people who are held accountable through the political process. Now, I supported Vice Chairman Barr's nomination, despite a number of policy differences I have with him, based in part on his commitment to stick to the Fed's narrow mandate. At his confirmation hearing, Vice Chairman Barr stressed that the Fed, and I quote, should not be in the business of telling financial institutions to lend to a particular sector or not to lend to a particular sector, end quote. I thank him again for that clarity, and I urge him to keep to that commitment. And one way we could do that is by pulling the Fed out of the politically contentious issue of global warming. Federal banking regulators have also been preoccupied in some cases with establishing new rules, the need for which have been dubious. For example, last month, the Fed and the FDIC proposed potential new requirements concerning the resolvability of regional banks. Now, this proposal seems to be predicated on the assumption that the only realistic option to resolve a large regional bank would be to sell it to an even larger bank. But it's not at all clear that that assumption is warranted or that new requirements are appropriate for regional banks for at least two reasons. First, the Fed and the FDIC have been approving regional bank resolution plans for nearly a decade. Nowhere do those plans contemplate wholesale acquisition by larger banks. Second, large regional banks have more than doubled their loss-absorbing capital since the financial crisis, and this dramatically improves their resiliency and dramatically decreases the likelihood that they would need to be resolved. Now, maybe some regulators seem to think that Benefits of new regulations always outweigh the cost, but we know that regulation is not without cost. And as regulation increases, financial activities will continue to migrate out of the banking system as they have been doing in recent years. Now, while some of our banking regulators have been distracted, they failed to address real challenges facing the financial system. For example, last year, the Fed, the FDIC, and the OCC committed to providing greater clarity on the involvement of banks in crypto activities such as providing custody services or issuing stable coins. Well, over a year later, they've still provided no public clarity. And during that same period, we've seen several high-profile collapses of crypto companies, including a very prominent example just last week. I think it's very possible that customers harmed by these collapses would have been better off 
if their crypto assets had been safeguarded by regulated banks that have been providing custody services for other kinds of assets for literally hundreds of years. But many banks have been pressured by you not to provide crypto-related services until your agencies provide this clarity, which just hasn't been forthcoming. I will note, however, that Chairman Harper seems not to have pursued this pressure campaign with credit unions. In fact, he's issued guidance for credit unions on partnering with crypto companies or using distributed ledger technologies. However, the ambivalence of the remaining agencies has helped to push crypto activities into foreign jurisdictions with weaker or no regulatory regimes. I mean, as a general matter, it seems to me the failure of Congress to pass legislation in this space and the failure of regulators to provide clear guidance has created ambiguity that has driven developers and entrepreneurs overseas where regulations are often lax at best. One other item I want to highlight before we start the rest of the discussion, and it's the deteriorating liquidity in the U.S. Treasury market. In March of 2021, the Fed committed to modify the Supplementary Leverage Ratio, or SLR, in part to facilitate bank dealers' ability to intermediate in this market. Over 18 months later, the Fed still has not acted. Now, I understand Vice Chairman Barr has only been in this role for four months, and he has reasonably suggested that potential amendments to the SLR should be in the context of reviewing all capital requirements. I understand that. But we really should recognize that a significant decline in Treasury market liquidity is already occurring and absent an improvement. I'm afraid that the Fed might one day decide it has to intervene by restarting bond purchases, which would be quite contrary to its current mission of getting inflation under control. What I hope I'll hear from our banking regulators today is that they will prioritize these and other real challenges and not stray beyond their mandates into politically contentious issues or establish unnecessary new regulatory burdens. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.